So it is Wednesday, April 17th, uh, 2019. Tomorrow, the Mueller report drops semi-publicly. We don't know how much, for whom, whatever, but something ought to happen. Uh, and this is Rex, the Relationship Economy Expedition, our monthly check-in call. I usually start these with a poem, so I'm going to read one just because. <clears throat> this poem is titled, Compulsively Allergic to the Truth. <laughs> By, yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. By Jeffrey McDaniel. <clears throat> Compulsively allergic to the truth. I'm sorry I was late. I was pulled over by a cop for driving blindfolded with a raspberry scented candle flickering in my mouth. I'm sorry I was late. I was on my way when I felt a plot thickening in my arm. I have a fear of heights. Luckily, the earth is on the second floor of the universe. I'm not the egg man. I'm the owl who just witnessed another tree fall over in the forest of your life. I am your father, shaking his head at the thought of you. I am his words, dissolving in your mind like footprints in a rainstorm. I am a long-legged martini. I am feeding olives to the bull inside you. I am decorating your labyrinth, tacking up snapshots of all the people who've gotten lost in your corridors. I'll read it again, just for grins. Nice. Compulsively Allergic to the Truth by Jeffrey McDaniel. I'll put the link in our chat after I've finished reading it. I'm sorry I was late. I was pulled over by a cop for driving blindfolded with a raspberry scented candle flickering in my mouth. I'm sorry I was late. I was on my way when I felt the plot thickening in my arm. I have a fear of heights. Luckily, the earth is on the second floor of the universe. I am not the egg man. I am the owl who just witnessed another tree fall over in the forest of your life. I'm your father shaking his head at the thought of you. I am his words dissolving in your mind like footprints in a rainstorm. I'm a long legged martini. I'm feeding olives to the bull inside you. I'm decorating your labyrinth, tacking up snapshots of all the people who've gotten lost in your corridors. Hey, Bill and Dave are here. Welcome to the call. I was in another screen, did not see you arrive. Okay. <clears throat> Very nice to see everybody. Uh, and Dave, you have, your, 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 your landscape has gotten very calm and very, very fjordic. Kind of restful, yeah. That's yeah, our, I like it. Our favorite place in Vermont. Uh, beautiful, and you are well lit. You are like, your whole ambiance has changed, even though I think you're probably sitting in exactly the same spot as usual, right? You probably know my corner, yes, indeed. Yeah, and, and, and you know what? It's, it's completely different now for us. Our, <laughs> our, our Zoom experience is much amplified. <laughs> is that a green screen? Yeah, Zoom supports the green screen just kind of natively, so you can choose your background and... It's Zoom's going to change the world, I swear. What should Zoom do next? Well, I don't know. The thing I talked about with you, I, I still think this, um, what, what, what'll be interesting to do next is to the YouTube kind of of Zoom. And when you aggregate a bunch of uh, different kinds of interaction that is virtual, and as people slowly adapt, adopt that, I mean, I think we still resist it pretty strongly, but I assume we'll stop. And so we'll do more and more of our life in this format. But we'll be interactive instead of watching passively, watching TV passively, we'll be interactive. Yeah, yeah, uh, super interesting. I mean, <clears throat> I'm curious what these things look like because Inside Jerry's Brain is an attempt to play with that a little bit, <clears throat> but in a really limited way, meaning it's still Zoom, we're still sitting around talking, it's more or less like this, except I'm screen sharing my brain more than usual. And we're sort of riffing off of it more than usual, but otherwise it's kind of this, right? And I think it's, uh, I think it'd be really interesting to figure out what's the, in, in 30 years, assuming that we're going to do a lot more virtual stuff, what is it going to smell like, look like, feel like? I still go back to your, when you had Ken Homer do the, uh, the, the, uh, the somatic exercises, the somatic exercise classes, kind of my, like, it dawned, well, like well, if you can do an exercise class on zoom and get people moving around and stuff, well, that if, Jane, if, kind of the, if Jane Fonda could do it in the 80s, why not? <laughs> and this is better than TV, right? So, yeah. I would like to contribute two examples because I've been watching this 
very closely, sort of year by year, week by week. So one of the big things um, that I've noted is that none other than Eileen Fisher, she of the mall stores and clothing lines, um, she showed up at Wisdom 2.0, the conference a couple years ago with an initiative about the body, that thing that goes at the mind body that goes in the clothes. Mm -hmm. And she also has some sort of facility near her home in uh, New York State where some sort of leadership, improvement, programming, something anyway, out of this rich stew um, comes a series of simple Zoom. There's nothing fancy about the technology of bringing together groups of women, like a, a public invitation to come together and kind of hang out, right? It's, it's um, big brand, big invitation to uh, the world of women at large. It's facilitated, but it's very simple. And they're, they're really well done. They, you break into, um, uh, what do they call them? Uh, Subroom? Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. it's, so nothing <laughs> fancy in the technology, but it's really being used for a social movement and a moment in time of women to... And these are, these are face-to-face -face meetings? These are Zoom things? What, these what's are Zoom it? things. It's all Zoom. It's all Zoom. It's just Zoom, when, right? When you know Zoom, you know it's just Zoom and well-designed email and a nicely paid staff. Very interesting. Uh, yeah. It's, um, and then I myself have done yoga um, on Zoom uh, in small groups with sort of purposely purposefully designed yoga sessions um and quite wonderful because you can i do it on my phone in fact and lay the phone on the floor next to me yep yep and then switch to the ipad at the end right yeah it's for so even asleep, today without, without any knowledge beyond the total willingness to participate in zoom across uh, demographics, right? You you have it changing the world. Fascinating. Does uh, does anybody here now think that we're moving toward augmented reality, shared re shared spaces, where we are all wearing gla glasses or goggles and we're seeing each other as if we were sitting at the conference table I'm at right now? Anybody think that's happening soon? Not me. I'm not a fan so much. I mean, so for me, like the, the AR, VR and all that is going to transform gaming. I think, I think for, for things like Fortnite or whatever, uh, Worlds of Warcraft, Fortnite, and the, the futures of those, I think that's a, a, a no-brainer, that, that the completely immersive experience where you're just wearing the display and you're interacting with things in a, in a different way, that, that makes total sense to me. But, but for like this kind of thing, I'm, I'm just still trying to imagine what's beyond this little Brady Bunch um, kind of, or is, was it Partridge Family where they do the, 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 the Hollywood squares like display at the beginning of the show? I right. went to, I attended a talk by the CEO of Zoom, a, a Zoom talk oh. uh, about this topic. And they were, sh they were oh. highlighting or announcing an intended partnership with an AR uh, uh, partner who, whose name I forget, but it was actually pretty compelling to be inside the Zoom platform, perhaps in the big window that you can also get right alongside the Brady Bunch and to be in a room together, right, in that context, kind of, you know, taking stuff that we, that we tried to be in, places we tried to be in 10, 15 years ago and, and building that into Zoom which I thought was pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. um, um, sorry, go ahead. Um, Bill, you were gonna say something? No. Oh, I thought you were. Uh, so I, I saw a demo of a Microsoft thingy where you can sort of be in the same space uh, in augmented reality, except everybody's wearing goggles, which means if I'm seeing you wearing goggles, I actually can't see your face or your expressions and your eyes are like the most expressive thing you have. So what they do is, they scan your face before you start using the room, 
They then project your face and lip sync. <clears throat> this is like awkwardness on top of awkwardness. They, they, then, they then project your face onto the 3D avatar that's actually showing up in the 3D rendition of augmented reality. And then they lip sync to your voice because your voice is coming through in perfect you know, fidelity because they are capturing your voice. But they have to make it look like you saying those things, which to me like falls directly into that little uncanny valley where it's like, I think that's SD there, but it looks like a bad lip sync of an SD. Like, yeah, how, how's, so I'm not, I'm still not compelled with that. And I don't see how to get around the wearing of goggles that basically obliterate half your face because holographic and other sort of, I, I, the other stuff doesn't seem to have shown up. Has anybody what, seen it? Why don't you just be a fancy backward camera like Pete's talking about? A fancy what kind of camera? Backward camera. They'll just have a camera inside your, your goggles, basically. Um, man, so, the, so it would capture your eyes from right up close in personal, in the, in the goggle. That'd be interesting. I mean, what would be fun would be to have, you know how they do, um, when a TV news anchor is reading the screen, they're actually looking at a, a one-way mirror that's over the lens of the camera that's shooting them. So it looks like they're looking into the lens and they can read the script that's being reflected off that lens. So what if it was like that? So that I could see stuff that you wouldn't see, but you could fully see me, right? That would be interesting. No, FYI, the Financial Times had a nice article on Zoom. It's going to go public this year. And uh, the Financial Times thinks it's a very good investment. And it's going to be valued about at $8.7 $8 .7 billion. $8 billion, $9 billion. Yep. Makes sense. Well, I, I stuck, a, if anybody's at all interested in this stuff, I, I stuck a link into a kind of a, the beginning of a slide deck trying to think this stuff through. I don't, I don't really have any idea what to do with it. But it feels really like this is, will happen. I mean, we will see... A, a Zoomy YouTube or something where people are doing, and part of the, I think, is to aggregate all the people who are willing to do different kinds of Zoom stuff. Because um, I do think we're still on the early part of that curve. And, you know, at some point, everybody will be doing it all the time, but right, we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. so how do you find Dan, what is, what is this document and whose fingers and head did it come out of? <laughs> you know, that's true. <laughs> it was mostly the head of Zeus. You know, the eye of Zeus? How does that work? So I was, I, I kind of got kicked off by Ben Roberts, I think. I don't know if you know him. He's got a group on Facebook called Movement Weavers. And we ended up talking a lot around this uh, conference weaving. Should we, could we network conferences together kind of concept? And he has been doing open space stuff on Zoom, um, which kind of works pretty well, you know, so you can kind of make it happen. And he was, and he's got a bunch of people who are really good at facilitation that he's working with. And I was just watching good facilitation on Zoom. And kind of like what Jerry does, you know, just naturally, you know, it yep. just works. And starting to, and then just rocking that, wow, I think that this will be a, it's a different thing than YouTube, but it will be a thing. What's it going to look like, you know? And, and I think there ought to be like a worker on co-op kind of thing that the people who host the stuff own the platform. So, um, so I'm, I'm literally writing a plan to create uh, for uh, a movement, an organization facilitating a movement using these. So Dave, can you get, can, what's the next step here? You know, I, I, I was really excited about this slide deck for about three weeks and then I kind of have just dropped it. <laughs> and I don't, I don't really know as I mean, I, I probably don't have, I would love to follow somebody. I'm, I'm probably not a good person to lead anything. And this is as, about as far as my thinking has gotten on it. I'm kind of convinced it's real, but I'm not sure I was going to do anything about it. So if you've got something that you're acting on, please, you know, take whatever's useful. And I'd be happy to, to back you up, but. Yeah, I would love a sort of handoff deep dive or something with you and or Ben or whoever kind of wants to be there. Okay. Um, Ben's kind of like on a different path thinking about it, but it's an interesting path. So, and I'm sure he'd love to talk to you about it. Can you describe what Ben's up to? I don't, you know, the little, I couldn't quite get, to me, this thing was very clear. I could like, I could imagine a YouTube that does interactive live stuff. And he wanted to do, it seems to me more like a 24 seven event that's just always on. Think of an unconference that never ends or something like Interesting. that. Interesting. Or like the, like Joey Ito's IRC channel. 
I, that was kind of how I equated it. I don't know if Ben would put it there or not, but yeah, yeah. it's like a, you know, and it's, and it's, it, and it's very focused on this movement weaving concept. So there is very much a social change orientation towards it. Mine was a little bit more platform agnostic. Like I, I, you know, I think that there would be a lot of good things happening, but it's a platform, right? Um, and anyway, so there's, there's a little bit of a difference between it. Is it a, is it a host? Is it hosting other people or is it a, a you know, a, a conference kind of, we, we were trying different metaphors. Like, are you, are you building a conference? What if you're building, maybe you're building a virtual conference center and people are essentially renting rooms, mm -hmm. you know? And you're providing some of the, the billing facility kind of stuff, right? Part of it's like, how do the people who are actually hosting live events like like Jerry's Brain? I mean, Jerry's Brain would be a natural thing to fit into this context. How do you get paid? Do people subscribe? Is there a is there a donor component? Um, you know, is there a subsidy to the platform? Those kinds of kinds of things. And then the cross marketing, right? The referral engine. Gee, you like this yoga class? You should try this sangha, um, you know, kind of thing. Right. Uh, would be, I think, built into the platform. Has anyone used a house party? The FT is mentioning that that's a, a, a live video app for kids, for teenagers. House party? Start up targeting teens on video chat? I, I've got, at the very end of this slide deck, I stuck in a few things I've heard about and that I haven't necessarily played with, and house <laughs> parties on that list. All this, the gaming folks, I think, are the ones that are, you know, way out front of this kind of stuff, so. It's interesting no. because um, house parties uh, started in 2017. I, I haven't heard much of them, but I think they are, you know, growing. And and you know, Google Hangouts does multi-party video, and I was trying to, I was struggling to use it to do this kind of stuff, and it was just, just the UI was not clean and sharp, and and they didn't put anybody on, as Google does, they didn't put anybody on on it that could actually make it better. And so I stopped using it and I'm paying money to separately to Zoom. And I, I would be perfectly happy to use Google Hangouts if it worked. And, and I think Google worked very hard to make the video on Google Hangouts scale to large numbers of people, uh, which is interesting. So, so Google technically is, is really good, but they just can't figure out the UI on this thing. So, Jemay, welcome to the call. We, uh, we're on a riff that's kind of started when I was like, hey, welcome to the Zoom. Gosh, I wonder what Zoom is going to look like in 20 years from now. Are we heading toward augmented reality? How does that work, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm still trying to get over the, the old pictures of you you put on Facebook recently. So I'm like, <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Back when I was dreamy. Oh, dude, I, I, I want to see those. I bet those are fun as hell. <laughs> you need to be on Facebook to see those, Bo. I am, but I, I guess I'm not friends with Jamey. Well, you can fix that. Right. Yeah, I, although I, basically that was on Facebook simply because we got forwarded from Instagram. I haven't been doing... I haven't really been logging into Facebook lately. Ah, you haven't been booking the face. Nope. Um, hi, folks. Uh, sorry, it's been, it's been a while. It's been a rather hectic last few months for me, um, including uh, a week in Stuttgart, a week home, then a week in Dubai. Um, Sweet. That was exhausting. Although I can say that everything you've heard about Emirates business class, it's all true. Really? Yeah. Um, it's kind of amazing. Um, so yeah, the Dubai folks, Dubai, uh, described it to my wife, uh, uh, Dubai is kind of like, what if Las Vegas actually had a lot of money? Um, oh boy. That's a little frightening actually to me. Wow. Um, Dubai, I, I still can't quite decide how I feel about Dubai because on the one hand it is the, by far the, um, most socially open country in the region. Um, uh, it's, you know, in some ways it's like Lebanon back in the seventies, mm -hmm. if you remember any of the stories. Interesting. Of so Beirut being the Paris of the Mediterranean sort of. Um, you know, it's easy. So I was at a, I spoke at a media conference, uh, Arab media forum. It's their seven, uh, 18th annual. And, um, you know, it's like a snapshot of what Dubai is. It's a microcosm of what Dubai is because you have um, men in very traditional robes. Abayas? No, the men. Are they, it, is the abaya for men as well? I thought the abaya was the men's uh, the men's robe. No? no abaya is the women's robe. Huh, okay. um, but the, the robe and the kafaya, uh, you know, and, you know, chatting with men in, you know, business suits and, you know, men in jeans and t-shirts and 
w- women in full abaya, you know, with head, you know, head coverings, some even with face coverings, standing there chatting amiably with women, you know, in skin tight, you know, body conscious outfits. Um, you know, it, nobody had their arms exposed. That was the, you know, they had a little sign saying respectful clothing, please, which, you know, indica- with a little indicator of no tank tops. Um, but um, it was, you know, it's very common to see people with radically different styles of dress, you know, working with each other, chatting with each other. Um, oh, alcohol. sorry, it's a, the men's is called a dishdasha. Thank you. Um, you know, and... Uh, you know um the foreign workers you know most of the of the of the workers are from india uh, they seem reasonably uh, i didn't see any indications that they were uh, treated the same way workers are treated in like oman or um kuwait um but you know i can't be certain about about that you know mm-hmm. it's um but they have a lot of money and they like to spend a lot of money on bringing people in that they think are smart um, to come and talk to them. And they have, they're actually building a museum of the future, hmm. which is this giant toroid building. It is, you know, it is literally a, it's almost like it's kind of squashed bagel with covered with Arabic writing. Um, except it's going to be like eight stories tall. Um, and uh, I actually have a video of my talk. I was one of the kickoff speakers. Oh, cool! Um, it was. Um, I can put a put a link in the chat if people are great. interested. It's only twenty minutes. Um, it's only twenty minutes, and it basically I was asked. To, I was given twenty minutes into the future as the title, and so I had to come up with something for that. And uh, I, I, my first reaction is: did anyone remember the old Max Headroom TV show? Mm-hmm. 20 Whatever minutes in, 20 minutes into the future was the slug line at the end, beginning of every episode. Oh. And I thought, there's no way they, these guys can't be all Max Headroom fans in Dubai. So they can't be riffing on that, can they? Probably not. Um, Interesting. But uh, let's see. Is that is this link? And stick the link here. Good link Swink. over here. Thank you very much. Um, basically, my. What I chose to talk about was is going to talk about a little bit about climate, a little bit about um, brittle systems, a little bit about AI, but most of it about manipulations of our perception of reality. Um, you know, everything from uh, if they, um, this person does not exist dot com. You guys know that play, that Dave, site. Dave Ritzel, Dave Ritzel is not actually in a spacecraft heading toward a. A planet right now. Um, have you have you seen this person does not exist dot, dot com? I just I added, put a link in the chat. It is a what they call a generative adversarial network. Mm-hmm. It's a neural network that does face generation, and in in the course of a fraction of a second, it will put up a completely computer generated face. This person does not exist. About two thirds of them are utterly believable. The uh, the other third will have little weird little artifacts like their eyes pointed in slightly different directions or different earrings on on either ear or the hair looks look kind of weird, but about two thirds of them are completely utterly indistinguishable from reality. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I I use the same not not this site but a, a composite picture of a whole bunch of of artificially generated photos and I, I used it in a presentation a month ago and I said none of these humans has ever existed. And ever, or ever will, um, but they look completely realistic. Blah 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 blah. So I was I was riffing on the same sort of thing you you were just riffing on. And so, um, you know, talking about well, this is with stills. It'll be you can do this with video fairly soon. Uh, you're basically in a world where it's oh. difficult to believe what you're being shown. Actually, can you do that in your announcer voice? In a <laughs> world where. A Sorry. world, a world in which. Yes, a world in which. That's your, that's your start. Sorry. This is this is a world in which it's impossible to know what's real. Perfect. Um, Perfect. Now you need like a cigarette and some lazy smoke curling. <laughs> <you gotta show. laughs> 
then I start getting, that's when I start channeling um, Rod Serling. Rod Serling, of course. Um, but, uh, <laughs> sorry. No, this, the, what I end up arguing is that selfies are self-defense. Oh, that interesting. Selfies, you know, the act of taking a picture of yourself, identifying place and location is your statement of documentation. Here I am. Here's where I am at this point, at, the, you know, at this time, in this location, um, and I can prove it. If, there no, show you. if there's no pictures, it didn't, it didn't happen. Yeah, yeah exactly. You know, pictures are proof. Yeah. Well, you know, and in a, in a world where you have, it's so easy to manipulate pictures, ha having distributed documentation is even more important. So a, yeah. a, an event where you have dozens of people taking pictures with their different phones on different networks. That is much more believable documentation than a single, single camera, no matter how, uh, quote unquote, legitimate. Right. Multiple people taking pictures of the same event, blah, blah, blah. I mean, <clears throat> maybe, maybe that would convince flat earthers. What we need to do is get aliens to take photos of Earth, selfies of, with, them, with the Earth in the background from different angles in the galaxy. Um, sure, Jerry. Why not? That'll convince them. A, a, a brief, a really brief tangent, given that you were in Dubai and we're talking about sort of the wealth of the area. So April and I last week were at the Conference on World Affairs for the third year running, which we now love. And Jamie, when what year were you there? I was there twice in, um, oh, uh, a few years. Uh, Five years before or something like that? Something like that. Yeah. Um, so we, we're now very happy uh, participants in this thing. We'll probably get invited back. And this year there were two young Serbians who, I'm, who I made friends with through, through the thing. They were panelists on uh, the Gen, Gen Z uh, panel that I was in the audience for at the beginning. Anyway, uh, the young woman created a startup that is hard, kind of hard to guess. In fact, I played 20 questions with it with another person over lunch uh, on Saturday. Uh, she is selling camel food for racing camels in the Arab Crescent. And here's the website, protocamel.com. <laughs> and she's selling it to, it's, it's a B2B business. So she's selling to distributors in those countries. They're doing just fine. Thank you very much. They've done three countries so far. The business is under a year old. And apparently, I need to fact check this. Um, racing camels, winning racing camels are worth a lot more than thoroughbreds in the horse racing world. Hmm. Which is kind of kind of crazy but is a thing and so i, I could I, see that i could yeah, see that it, it got really got me thinking there are probably niches like this all over the world of funny things tucked away that you don't think about and it turns out that you know everybody in the camel racing business basically gives their camel a bag of oats and honey or, or dates and honey before the race it's like no 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 that's that's a bad idea so they've created some formula blah 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 you can imagine <laughs> kind of the rest but it's like it, it, it's a business and and She's part of an entrepreneurship school that the guy uh, Serbian uh, founded, and it all kind of fit together in a, in a really cute, memorable story fashion. Cool. Um, cool. Anyway, now back to our regularly scheduled show, which is already in progress. <laughs> uh, let, let me go quiet for a second and see what other Rexy kind of things any of the rest of you have been involved in that we would like to talk about. I have a puzzle I'd love to throw out, and, and please, you guys, you guys are the, the the right crowd to throw it out to. But I've been, I was, I'm reading, I was reading through the set of essays on uh, math. Uh, it's called um, From Einstein to Gödel, I think, or something. It's great, great book of essays, just kind of stories about math, and I can understand. I'm trying to know much math, but um, one of the sections gets into a, a chunk where kind of the the theory of math is about being able to name something. And a whole bunch of math is just based on the ability. So I think it's kind of set theory or something. If you give the set a name, then it exists. And, and I, I was translating that back to my reluctance to use the president's name. Like it's a visceral thing. I want to, I just want, I want to call him the dumpster. I, I don't want to give him the credence. And I was just puzzled by my own reaction to names and the power of names. And I was thinking about it in terms of the context of the, our faces, I guess, uh, too. But, but is there something on the, is there something about names that really is special that I've never really thought through? Is that, is there a literature or anything? I don't know. 
That's I think, point. Yeah, I think there's a bunch of stuff here. You're reminding me right away of Marty, who we haven't seen on a Rex call for a while, but Marty said, talks a lot about how we speak the world into being. And, and I think the naming of things, which, you know, Phil, probably Umberto Eco and a bunch of other philosopher writers <clears throat> have dived into this, but I think that I think the, the fact of naming is a kind of uh, it's a kind of ownership. It's a kind of labeling. It's a kind of I don't know you know other sorts of things. Bo, did you hit a lot of stuff like in Heidegger and other places about names and naming? Yeah, in a way, it brings it into being. It's so you know that's what naming does. And it's so interesting how when we name something, we don't question it. I mean, we just don't. It like it makes it real to us, like addiction. Do we really know what that is? It like gives us this magical power. It's amazing what we, we, how we use words and how they create things that we don't even question. And they also, they also resonate. So, you know, if, if you call something a, a Cydron or a warmth adapter, you know, th those evoke very different parts of your brain. And, and, and they might be describing the same exact thing, but now your assumptions about its purpose and uses and amenability or or friendliness are completely different just, just by the label, right? So this labeling thing is super important. And, and uh, the funny part of my brain is, re is remembering the weird names of drugs these days because they've run out of drugs, drug names. So I'll, you know, remember to ask your doctor for mama slada plata mill. Oh, I have a Rexy thing to share. Um, yes. So recently, um, there, you know, I, there's this bookstore in town that I love to go to that's uh, this very quirky guy founded called Mother Foucault's. And um, the, the whole group there is just, I met the most amazing people. I mean, it's so great. Uh, no one asks you what you do. It's only about art. Like, anyways, so um, some old, there was a philosophy group meeting there on Mondays. And so I decided to go because they were reading one of my favorites is Hannah Arendt. So I really love her. So they're reading uh, Life of the Mind on Willing. Yeah, I love her. So I'm like, well, I might as well hang with these people. So I started going. And then, boy, I got hooked up to this whole underground in Portland. So it turns out this guy who started that group about a year ago um, just walked into the bookstore and says, hey, can I do this here? And, and you know, I was thinking of doing this. And then the next week he went there, the, the owner said, oh, I found about like seven people who want to do that. So he did it. But then it started this whole movement in Portland. So while I'm there, they're like, well, there's another group on Hegel. And there's another group on Kant. And there's another, and there's this thing. So it turns out on Meetup, there's a group of 1,000 people here in Portland that go to these philosophy things. And so you have like a, a and, it, and it's very open. It's not about, you know, um, they're not dictatorial. They're, they don't really, they don't like, they don't harsh on each other. They're, they're very open <laughs> and they're just like, let's talk about Foucault. And someone does a presentation on Foucault. So there's not like, there's also not, they, they deliberately rotate and let people just, you know, study something and talk about it. And the people that I, I've just been, I was just amazed. So they essentially, there's a whole bunch of people who aren't really knowledgeable in philosophy that are going to this. So you have older people, you have younger people from 20 somethings to 80 something year olds or people are going to these things. Very and cool. This one group that I'm in, the people in that group went out and started all those things. And it's just, and I went on Meetup, and I'm like, there's a thousand people in this group. <laughs> so, anyways, it, it's been really fun, and I've met some of the most fascinating, interesting people. That's really cool. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Anyone with riffs on naming or philosophy slams or anything like that? Well, naming is uh, in in myth, uh, and and story naming is very powerful you never tell anyone your true name because if they know your true name they can uh, they can do awful things to you so it's you know basically true names are the social security number Rumble of stuff. myth um and so you know you're talking about the power of names that's what immediately immediately leaps to mind that that by using 45's name in this particular context, you are acknowledging his power. Uh, and by, by naming, by giving him the name or using the name 45, you are acknowledging his position in history, but you have 
replaced his name with a number that in, um, at least in, in Western, in modern Western myth, a number is dehumanizing, you know, and, you know, there's also, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not a number, I'm an individual, except you're more likely to have an individual name if you, you know, an individual identifier if you're a number. And so there's a little bit of irony there, but by, by calling him 45, you're not acknowledging the power of his name. And how many yeah. of us remember the Prisoner series with Patrick McGowan? Mm. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, I don't know if you're looking at the screen, I'm screen sharing in my brain, beautiful nicknames for Trump. <laughs> now, Forrest Trump, uh, um, do you have Cheeto Benito? Cheeto Benito, I have Cheeto's yeah, Jesus. Uh, from Cheeto, is it? For, for I have Cheeto's Trump? Jesus. You know, Cheeto Benito and, uh, no, 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 B-E-N-I-T-O, Benito oh, Mussolini. Oh, nice. Okay, that's better. That was and, like, then, and similarly, Dorito Mussolini. All right, Dorito Mussolini. Per, oh, that's a nice one. <laughs> Any others? Uh, oh, God, there's a whole bunch of them. Um. <clears throat> I've got uh, the Coma of a Fascist, Twiddler, I like. It's very simple. Mm. <laughs> that's Crumple Thin Skin, that's a good one. The Orange Overlord of Absurdities, the Feral Shotting Meatball, Sneering Orange Man Child, Terroristic Man Toddler, Orange Face Fuhrer. You have short fingered. Um, short fingered Bulgarian is in very Bulgarian. important. Yes. yes. Short, here's short fingered Bulgarian with, of course, appropriate links to Graydon Carter. Uh, and here's the articles he wrote uh, about Trump that got under Trump's skin. Now, was short, field, short fingered Bulgarian, was that Vanity Fair or was that Spy? For some reason, I thought that was Spy Magazine. I don't know. Uh, Doonesbury, I think, kind of. No, started. no, it was, wasn't. It wasn't Doonesbury. Huh. Well, I'll have to find the etymology of this. Yeah. Um. And you were just asking. Wait, something else just popped up. Who who remembers what? Oh, the the prisoner with McGowan. Right. I love that show, and I love that show. It was good. So here's the prisoner. Mm -hmm. Under dystopian visions. You bastard, you have Roko's Basilisk there. Now we're all doomed. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Actually, I mentioned Rocco's Basilisk in, a, in an article or an essay for New Scientist last year, and I, I did I did include an apology at the end for their for the the future torture of their uh, digital twins. And I've forgotten I even ever put this in my brain. So thank you for pointing it out. <clears throat> um, where has all this put us? What what uh, what comes to mind in the in the Rexy scheme of things? Gary, what did you think of that article I sent you about um, you know comparing uh, the, about the Gilded Age being part synonymous with our age about how population pressure and uh, inequality and in income because of, you know, did you see that one? That was really interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's people talking about this being the modern Gilded Age <clears throat> and how uh, the robber barons have just, you know, got new clothes. They now look like startup people, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that that's super interesting. Um, and let me, so there's a bunch of people like Nick Hanauer who are saying, hey, billionaires have to be careful because there's so much inequality that historically when this happens, the people show up with pitchforks and overthrow the top, right? And Nick Hanauer, who's quite wealthy, has been very vocal about being out in the world saying this. Um, I had a moment at, the, at CWA last week where um, I was listening. It wasn't that first Gen, X, Gen Z panel that I was talking about earlier, but rather a little bit later where it dawns on me, oh, wait, I've been listening to Pete uh, Buttigieg who I really like, like when you hear him speak, 
he speaks in complete thoughts and he answers better than you can imagine anybody answering. Um, the morning after he actually formally announced, and he gave like a 30, 40 minute talk announcing his, his, his race, the morning after, uh, we were staying with friends in Boulder who were watching Morning Joe, which I never, ever, ever watch. And so Joe and Mika and four other people in and out of the video were all, were all interested, favorable, like saying, hey, this is a guy to watch, et cetera, et cetera. It was super interesting. So then I started reflecting, oh, wait, um, AOC in Congress, uh, Greta Thunberg mobilizing kids to strike out of school, uh, the Parkland kids uh, finally sort of really building a movement out of the school shootings. You know, uh, in fact, there was just a retro report about the Columbine shooting, which made me just really sad because I was looking at how horrible Columbine was and how senseless and how nothing really happened for years and years. And that, all of that little reminiscing and connecting those dots got me thinking, hey, might we be at a generational tipping point where somebody like Buttigieg, who I don't think is electable, but you know what? The last three Democratic presidents were all dark horses. Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, and uh, Barack Obama, all three of them, nobody thought were going to win. Current so, guy didn't have a lot of probability for him either, so. Pardon? The current guy was kind of a surprise too. The current guy was a big bad surprise in, in the worst of ways, right? The, 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 the current, Cheetos guy. Um, Your ability to predict may not be that good. Exactly. So, so let's not count Buttigieg out completely, but and it's also like two years I have to run, so it's, it's a long ways away. But the thing that made me do was actually uh, create a thought in my brain uh, called... I created a thought... Uh, Oh shoot! I thought it. Oh, here we go. It's under it's under Buttigieg for president, and uh, here is that how his name was pronounced? You know what? It's Boot Edge Edge is what he says. His husband says Buddha Judge is his mnemonic, and while watching that, I suddenly realized, oh my God, this guy's name is Booty Judge. Is like the so my mnemonic is Booty Judge which actually sounds like his name, more or less. And I'm like, oh, that's, that, there's a sort of weird little irony there. It's, it's just too on the nose. That would never be believable in fiction. Exactly. So Buddha judge, I think, is, is a reasonable way to pronounce it. And everybody's having to learn to pronounce it right now, which is very interesting. So I created this thought in my brain. Does 2020 mark a generational tipping point? Um, so we have the Green New Deal on the table, Medicare for All on the table, uh, Gen Z showing up, a wealth tax uh, uh, on the table, school strikes for climate change. I should, I should, uh, I, I guess that's Greta Thunberg. But a, are there any other um, events, incidents, movements that I should add to this list? B, do you agree or disagree? What do you think? Is this a? Might we be hitting a place where the reaction to Trumpismo and to the global shift to the right is so strong? that a lot of these groups managed to pull together and actually flip things. I, I personally think that that's true. And I've, I've sort of, a lot of the reading about the left has been that it's been too fragmented over the last 10, 15 years. And that in essence, it needed something to motivate it, to coalesce, to bring it together. And so to me, that's the value, in other words, and, and even right in the middle of this, we're getting the same reaction. We're getting too much fragmentation, too many people in the rut. The, 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 in other words, it's continuing even though it's coalescing, kind of. Totally agree, Bill. In, in fact, I think the left is worse. Like, I, I, was, I was pondering some of these issues and realized that um, on the right, there's like no, no bars held. Like Trump can say anything and he appears to still stay in office. On the left, you can't say much of anything without getting somebody, you know, up your nose about, you know, this is terrible, you did, you did what, et cetera, et cetera. So there's sort of a no forgiveness um, approach on the left and there's an anything goes approach on the right. And this is a very, very bad situation to go into an electoral cycle with. Really, really bad. The, the Democrats have to figure out how to both honor um, different people with different identities and backgrounds. Because to me, identity politics 
is a conservative phrase that is trying to corral all the people looking to be heard for generational trauma and a bunch of, a bunch of other things that are totally real and, and really important. The problem is they've now been corralled and the approaches for implementing identity politics, like, hey, let's not listen to Richard Spencer when he shows up at a campus, have destroyed a lot of our ability to actually speak and resolve and improve and whatever. So how might we fix that before the next two years are up? Well, okay, I'm just going to talk until somebody interrupts me. Go uh, for it, Bo. So there's, go ahead. there's two big things going on in our society. We have, we, we have a bifurcated economy. Uh, you know, I post, I post these links on Facebook, and I love how no one responds to them. <laughs> 71 per, 72 percent of the jobs created since 2008 happened in globe in San Francisco, New York, and the metro areas on the coast. 72 percent. So I also I've sent Jerry this great art list. So the inequality thing that's going on—it's also happening in Europe. The center of this country is out. They're gone. They're not growing. They're going nowhere. So we've got this bifurcated economy, and it's where you've got two speeds going on. And I think that accounts for what's going on, a great deal of what's going on with these frustration of the Trump voters, right? And the second thing is we have a skills gap. We have an economy. We've got a government. Oh, we have everything is structured for everyone having a, a job at Ford, Ford Motors. I mean, everyone's going to, we all know that we're all going to have to like retool ourselves two or three times in our careers. We have a knowledge economy and we're still acting like we have, we're, we're all working at Ford. Uh, for example, when you, everyone's going to have to reskill throughout their lifetime. So this whole idea of the way unemployment works right now, it doesn't work. You, I think people should be able to like go off of work, retrain themselves, not have to worry about uh, starving, not have to worry about health care, and then be able to go back in the economy. And so we have all these things to do. I just put a thing link in there that shows all these things. And I, when are we going to address these things? Because so far what we have is we have a lot of scared, angry people who are voting for people like Trump all over the, you know, by the way, all over Europe too, not just America. Yep. And these people have to be addressed and they do have a, a point. And yes, globalism took their jobs, but so did, um, so did technology. Automation. And boy, when you look at the fact that the economy that is inside, I've sent Jerry articles from this fabulous columnist at FT called Rana Fuhar. Is that the way you pronounce your name, Jerry? Faru Faruhar. Faruhar. Boy, she's sometimes on CNN, by the way. Anyway, she's brilliant. And she actually did this big thing where she went in the country and visited like um, companies that, had, that are, were surviving. And you, what you see are these factory floors bereft of humans. You know, I mean, this is a new world. These people, there's so much for government to do. And I've been banging on this for Jerry for a while. The thing that a lot of us don't realize is what happened in 08, 09 could have been a depression. And the way it wasn't a depression, it was unlike the depression, we didn't just let the banks fail, okay? What we did instead was we made sure none of the banks failed. <laughs> and and what, what John Maynard Keynes and everything, well, how we got out of the Depression was World War II. World War II was an excuse for a huge amount of fiscal spending. But what happened is, is no, the Republicans did not let Obama do any fiscal spending, right? Remember shovel-ready projects, which were killed, DOA? So what we've done, our current economic environment, where we sit right now, is all a result of the, the Federal Reserve and quantitative easing. Our economy is basically barely on life support, and, and what, what, what the Fed has done is essentially just go out there and buy all these bonds all along the yield curve and just push money in the economy, which has also pushed up housing, stocks. So, and it's not benefited. It's been wonderful for rich people, by the way, but it's not helped any of those other people who voted for Trump. And, right. and, and so we, we, we actually have a fantastic opportunity for a real new deal. We really do. We've got so much we can do. I've sent Jerry, like, does anyone know it? Rob Emanuel's like what he's done in Chicago with his free um, entrance into community colleges. So he's like cut the dropout, the dropout rate in high school by 20%. Rob Emanuel. I mean, there's all kinds of great things going on in this country. Um, and there's so, it's such a wonderful, actually challenging environment for someone like, I mean, Jerry and I have, you know, anyone who knows 
public policy or, or economics, this, this should be like a glory days for us to do something. And, and the ideas are all there. It, it doesn't take much. Anyway, so that's my screed. And what I, I'm just waiting. When is this going to enter the, the, our politics? When are we going to start talking about this? So, so Bo, I think just, just to interrupt you and get all of our voices in. That's enough. Um, <laughs> I, lo I, love, I love where you're going because there's a, there's a, a, there's a contradiction that the far right can't figure out right now, which is on the one hand, striking the note of fear, xenophobia, homophobia, whatever, keeps everybody in line and wins votes, wins elections, and keeps people kind of scared and, and, and in the party. Talking about how to address these problems would be fantastic, and there's some conservative and libertarian people who, who would have really good answers to what to do about those things, as you're describing, and yet that would mean not striking the fear bell over and over and over again so that people are fearful. Because this is, in order to start solving the problems and addressing these things, you actually would need to build things. And by the way, you'd need to build things that smell a little too much like Northern European social democracies, where if you're unemployed in Denmark, you get money to go study and money, <clears throat> you get paid to retrain, blah, 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 right? And they don't want any sniff of any of that. So, so I think you're, you're putting a really interesting dilemma on the table. And one of the reasons I love Buttigieg is that he is speaking in a way that I think will be heard by people on the right and the left. And he's addressing these things like head on, although not in enough detail. So he's not dropping to policy proposals level. I think on purpose, he's trying to keep his campaign up here, not down here yet. But He's saying things in a way, partly because he's very religious and partly because he's from the, the center of the country, et cetera, et cetera. He's speaking in a way that's attracting both sides. So there's a really nice possibility that people like him, not just him, could open up these conversations before the right does. I don't know. Other people, other ideas? I think Elizabeth Warren is the one who just about everything I see attributed to her comes from this place, Bo, of let's stop fucking around. We ha government has a lot to offer and we have huge systems problems that we can begin to take, that we can take, not just begin to take action on action, right? And I think AOC speaks the same language, um, especially to those of her demographic, right? Of her age group, to me as well. So. But I, I've, I'm really afraid of the circular firing squad that's going on. And I'm also really afraid of the pure fascism, right? We are literally walking down the path of, that led to Nazi Germany. And in we're the, not the only ones. Could, could take a look at Eastern it, Europe. That's right. Italy. That's right. And part of what I think from America we forget is that Nazism and that whole, that, that quote, world war, it wasn't just a German exercise, right? It was a whole region, right, went that way. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so these national borders, borders never mean anything in the land of, right, in, in, in times of fascism. And I'm literally, not just economically, but personally scared to death. Um, a small side note about fascism. <clears throat> fascism is really good for in large incumbent corporations. If fascism and corporatism go hand in hand very, very nicely because what fascism does is it destroys labor unions and any kind of pushback and it creates cartels or monopolies and gives the business to, the, to those businesses, the, the few that survive and, and, and get, to, get to do it, like Ige Farben uh, back in the day. Or Halliburton today. Pardon? Which one? Halliburton? Yeah. Right. And those companies do very, very well. So, so the people, you know, the executives of those companies are willing to pour a lot of energy, money, whatever, dark money into the system uh, because they're going to do just fine. Fascism is great for business, for a few businesses, not for the fringe businesses. They get squished out. Right. The 1%. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we are going to see this all come to a, uh, a, a really messy kernel, like a pimple, mm -hmm. in, the, in the next, uh, next six months. Because we are rapidly approaching a point where it's very likely that the administration will be directed by 
court, the Supreme Court, and, uh, to turn over, turn over documents, uh, allow the, the Treasury Department to release IRS information, and they will say, no, make me. Um, or, or they won't be directed by the court. Well, no, 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 but, but my, my, my point here is that, that it's, it's, be, it's, but both of them are bad. That, that is a possibility, but I'm, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is the you know, direct ref refutation of institutional, uh, of institutional norms. And we've, well, seen, the capture, we've seen this the happening all along. Versus the capture of the court system. Right. But we've, we've seen this happening all along to, a, to various degrees, but never to a point where there is no, um, no higher authority to appeal to. Right. Uh, and so where, where I'm... You know, where I'm fearful is isn't just that, you know, isn't simply that that the courts have been captured. Now that's a that's a definitely an issue, and it's um, very possible uh, that the Supreme Court will be completely politicized like that. But it's also very possible, and I think ultimately more even more dangerous for the executive to refuse to accept the rulings of the the courts, because um, there, there we have the. Um, well, it's always fun to be able to quote Stalin, and here it's uh, in reference to uh, criticism from the Catholic Church. How many divisions has the Pope? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know how 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 many uh, police officers has the Supreme Court? <clears throat> One of the really chilling things I heard early last week in Boulder was a, a liberal journalist who was saying, hey, look, it's pretty easy to envision because Trump loves rallies. It's going to have many, 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 many rallies in the next two years. It's pretty easy to envision him uh, telling rally attendees in an open carry state to bring their weapons and then to print hats that say, hey, these are my Second Amendment people. And the abbreviation for this would be SA. Second Amendment is SA, which would be an echo of Hitler's Sturmabteilung, which was the SA, which precedes the SS. And I don't know that he wants to go, but, but I don't know that he wants to go down the path, but I, I was just sitting there with my blood turned to ice going, holy crap, I can totally envision that. Well, did you see the, um, the um, Michael, something blanky on his name, the uh, Cohen, uh, um, no, say interrogation, testimony? But, uh, testimony yeah. where one of the last things he said was he does not believe that Trump will leave office willingly. Yeah, yeah, that was and that kind of got glossed over, and all the other crap that that he was talking about, because that to me was <laughs> the single most important thing that he said. You know, the recognition that this is, you know, it, it, um, if we think that reality has be been horrible so far, now it's time. Now reality is about to say, "Hold my beer." Okay, uh, okay. It's um, you're at a point where things are about to get could get significantly worse, and I, I think that the um, no, and the thing is, it wasn't just that he said, what if? The, the really important thing is that Cohen said he won't. It was, he, didn't, he didn't phrase it as a, you know, as a possibility. He, he framed it as a, um, as a certainty. As an assertion. Go ahead, Bob. So also let's talk about Trump trying to pack the Federal Reserve and politicize the Federal Reserve. Which right. Was right. Uh, but, you know, frankly... Uh, by the way, right-wing freaks uh, that are in my family thought that Obama wasn't going to let go of power either. Uh, Did you? Ha but Eric Holder or similar you know, per people never actually made the assertion. And to, to me, that's – yeah, you, you can make all sorts of claims. I mean, hell, we thought the same thing about W and Cheney. Um, but uh, oh. it wasn't somebody from within the administration saying, I don't think this guy's going to leave. Oh, I want to pose, pose and, a question. And saying it – on public TV in a congressional hearing. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's a big deal. You're making me really want to have a cigarette. I'll have a cigarette for the group in a minute. In okay. Front of okay. Um, but I want to post something to the group that really makes me, when we concentrate on Trump and we're not concentrating on, you know, talking to the people like, hey, we know you're in a bad shape. We know your jobs have disappeared. That's what kind of worries me about this Trump talk, you know? Like, why don't we, like, instead of get caught up in his game, just go, so, okay, I want to leave, there's to the group, I'm shutting up now, I'm going to have a cigarette for all of you, okay? Perfect. Um, so, what, one of the things I loved about, and I haven't heard Booty Judge's whole announcement speech from Sunday, but one of the things I did hear that I loved, and it's up early in, this, in the talk, is 
enough of this, like focusing on Trump all the time, we're going to change the channel. And I thought change the channel was a completely brilliant, simple metaphor to use because Trump is a media animal. He's a celebrity, you know, celebrity TV, a reality TV celebrity, et cetera, et cetera. And he said, we're going to change the channel and talk about these problems that we need to face, which, which is really fantastic. I, mean, I, I think something interesting about Buttigieg is that he seems to be able to pick very, very simple language to say uh, the right things in a way that is memorable and I think will, will, will carry. Whether he survives, you know, a couple of primaries, who knows. But, um, but I'm, I'm rooting for him. We also heard um, uh, Amy Klobuchar was a speaker in person on Saturday night, Friday night, uh, last week. So she came and, you know, talked to the audience. She was pretty good, um, but not, like, she's a no-nonsense person. She wants to run as a... As a uh, pragmatic progressive basically who gets things done. Uh, but I wasn't, I wasn't electrified by her like I am listening to uh, Pete, Mayor Pete. Somebody want to jump in? Yeah, Bill. Let, let, let me just sort of like paint a bigger picture because to an extent we're focusing on the United States and, and to me part of the problem in this situation, has anybody ever seen what they call the, the elephant curve? In other words, which shows how the bulk of the jobs that have been created over the last 20, 30 years have been in the third world. And that, in essence, that's what's drawing away the potential of ever having any kind of sort of response for the flyover America. And so, in, in a way, that, when, that, which you then combine with things like the uh, TPPS, you know, the, the uh, Trans-Pacific partnership programs and things like that where the global globalization is sort of taking hold and basically insisting that they get their way wherever you know in the world it's occurring and then you add on top of that the statistics that show that that basically the one percent control our legislature in other words that for the last 30 years if the population by the tune of like 80 90 percent wanted something if the one percent didn't didn't want it it didn't happen happen. And they've had three, three major universities, uh, I think it's Princeton and Northwestern and some other one that have done these studies and said that we're just shit out of luck when it comes to legislating. So to me, some of the languaging, changing the channel, figuring out, unless you have a systemic change, we're screwed. In other words, that concept of fascism, in other words, corporate socialism, basically controlling the conversation and more important, controlling the action. They literally do not want to see any of these problems resolved. Right. They benefit from having the confusion, having the flyover, having the hate, having the, the, the whole negative conversation stay inflamed. They benefit from it. By well, this way, is Steve let's... Bannon's strategy. Sorry, go ahead. I want Jermaine to... Jermaine, I, you're a futurist. I view that there's always an oligarchy ruling. Uh, and with that article I, I posted up there about return of the oppressed. Um, basically, uh, in the beginning of the century, of the 20th century here in America, remember we had Bolshevism. We, the FBI was formed because we had anarchism. Uh, things were really bad. And we've gone through these phases before. And frankly, this actually causes me hope. And there's always been an oligarchy. And it's funny, I, I've passed an article on to Jerry from the Financial Times. Remember, the Financial Times is the, it's an elite global newspaper. And a, a columnist was saying, yeah, it's, you guys better hope, you know, scare them with socialism. Definitely scare the oligarchs with socialism. And I'm, I'm frankly for that. I, I, I love seeing them scared with socialism because they need to move off the dime and realize things got to change. And, they, and we've gone through this cycle before. Jamaica, please weigh in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I agree. We're screwed. Um, okay, good. You know what? Uh, You've been saying you're doomed for so long. It's finally coming true. Aren't you sort of in some puzzling, difficult, dark way happy? No, I, I really wish I was wrong. Good. Okay. Thank no, God. No, you that, that's actually one of, one of the things I was thinking about this morning that just thinking about all the various forecasts I've been working on, you know, especially lately around climate stuff. I, I, oh, I have so hope I am completely 180 degrees wrong. I would be so happy to be utterly, utterly mistaken about the world. 
because, you know, what I'm seeing right now is not fun. You know, the, 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 for, the forecasts that I'm wrestling with, uh, whether they are social, you know, brittle systems, whether they are political, you know, rising, you know, uh, fascist nationalism, uh, and again, not it's not just the U.S. and not even just U.S. and Eastern Europe. I mean, hell, we were just talking about Brazil, Duterte, Bra Brazil, Italy, um, Duterte. Uh, the the power of uh, UKIP and and Neil, and Nigel Farage in in the UK and Boris Johnson. Um, the the fact that um, the uh, National Front. Natural front, the, the French fascist, uh, neo fascist group came in second in the elections mm -hmm. last, last time. I mean, this is a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then you layer climate, you know, climate issues on top of that. And, um, and yet, one of the most interesting moments I had in Dubai was I, I love giving talks in places like that because I, I enjoy throwing in lines that, it are quietly or loudly subversive, and one of the one of the things I said was, uh, you know, quoting the old, and I don't know who said it originally, but I've you know, it's been around for years. Um, when you make peaceful revolution impossible, you make violent revolution inevitable. And I had several people come up to me afterwards, several Dubai citizens come and, and ask me for, you know, say they really loved that line that it was, they, that really resonated with them. Um, you shouldn't have said something like that in the Gulf states. They're always I, worried about that, my man. <laughs> <laughs> the on, the plan, on the tarmac, ready for yourself. You know, you know um, at least I didn't uh, say, call someone a horse online because then I could be arrested. That was the, the news from a couple of year, couple of weeks ago. A woman called a uh, her ex husband's new wife a horse. You know, a British woman called her uh, a woman in Dubai a horse. And when she arrived in Dubai to go to her ex husband's funeral, she was promptly arrested for online defamation. Wow. Yeah. So didn't call anyone a horse. That's was that's the a, important was thing. Was it an infidel horse? I mean. <laughs> But by the way, fascism isn't good for globalism. Fascism, like what Trump's doing, is he's tearing down the WTO. He's he's actually this won't be good for global corporations. It's it's good for your friends. It's very much um, what do they call it? Cronyism. It's cronyism. Mm -hmm. and, right. it's crony. and so fascism creates a is a big threat actually to to global multinationals. For the global markets, yes. <sighs> So it's not hand in hand. Google won't be wanting fascism, though of course they're kind of playing ball with China. And let's not forget that that ball in the room. China, the competition right now between China and the U.S. is ooh, that's something else. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm calling it the what's it? It's the or it's the tech war, really. If you think about it, I love that. I use that term. A tech, a tech war, like William Shatner books? No, I haven't read. Those books. No, no, he actually wrote a, wrote a, a series of books in the God nineties, you know, called that were called Tech War. It was a Tech War series. My brain is a repository of weird stuff, almost as weird as as Jerry's digital brain. And we're getting a bifurcation in the internet. We have the great you know digital wall of China, and we've got Belt and Road Initiative, and 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 I just read how China is now get inserting themselves in all the uh, the islands, the Solomon Islands, all of Micronesia, all those things. China is in so much trouble. China is in so much trouble. Do you think? Please go um, on. Yeah, more. no, it, it's the, um, the harder you clench your fist, the more systems will slip through your fingers, you know, to, to quote Princess Leia. Um, the, they're cracking down really hard in the West on mm -hmm. the Uyghurs. And to the point of they're actually putting together what have been called concentration camps. Yes, re-education camps, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, the... Uh, she is becoming uh, just pretty much despotic with power. I mean, I, I, you probably heard about the, um, the oh God, it was the She Lessons app that all state employees, including educators, have to download and use that basically you have to do a number of, of, of the lessons from the, the thinking of Chairman Xi on this app every day to generate enough points to be able to avoid being investigated for not being sufficiently patriotic. 
Um, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll dig up the the information on it and post it, but it uh, put it on the the chat or in, right. into the email. But it's Thanks. but you're at a point where they are clamping down so hard out of the recognition that a lot of the system isn't working. Um, that I, I think that one of the things we're going to see over the next twenty years is the the shift of attention of radical Islam from the West to China. Um, and I don't know how China how well China is going to handle that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, they are, they're in serious trouble around climate issues as well. And while they but are they're actually, but they're actually acting on those more, yes. than, more than anybody. They're, well, okay. They're, they're the biggest, they're the second biggest country in the world. They're going to be more than anybody about anything. No, no, no. But they're actually acting on it. We're, we're pretty big and we cause most of it and we're doing crap. Well, Right, but they're act when they decide to move a whole bunch of coal plants, they just move a whole bunch of coal plants. It, they haven't been building more coal plants, but they haven't been shutting them down either. Mm -hmm. you know, that's you know they're they've been doing a lot with solar, mm -hmm. um, but they're still building more cars than anybody. Mm -hmm. um, they're also building more electric cars than anybody. But again, they're the biggest. They're going to be the most. Yeah. Um, I, I am reluctantly dubious about how aggressively they're pushing the climate stuff. I think a lot of it is for, is for global public consumption. Interesting. Um, hey, Jamie, why don't, could you address India a little bit? So that... <laughs> and then can you do Malaysia? Oh, India. Yeah. India is going to be fun. Have you heard about the, um, uh, the uh, cow violence? Uh, okay, there's a yes, particular I term for it. I have heard about it. Yeah, that basically cow activists are going and, and beating up or killing Muslims for uh, for insulting cattle. Yeah, I, I don't know how many people here know this, but India right now, Modi is a Hindu nationalist. Now, let's repeat that. That's like having a Christian nationalist president. It, yeah. It's, a, it's, not, it's not a great yeah. situation. No, well, it, uh, yeah, definitely add, add right India now. to the list of places that are going down this kind of nationalist hellhole. I think Esty wanted to jump in. Uh, India's yeah, in the I, election cycle right I, now. Go ahead, Esty. I just wanted to say that I need to run off to be at a 1030. So, um, and I wish I smoked. <laughs> <laughs> and I already had enough coffee to um, <laughs> energize a horse. So I'm not exactly sure what I'm doing with myself. Meditation uh, and yoga. To, uh, to quote, to quote Lloyd, Lloyd Bridges from Airplane, looks like I picked the wrong week to stop sniffing glue. <laughs> exactly. So um, if you in the next few minutes come up with an appropriate collective uh, after action, um, please do share. Um, uh, uh, and uh, I guess I'm trying to say thank you. <laughs> thank you. We'll, we'll, send, we'll find a nice uh, unicorn meditation video on YouTube and send it to the list. <laughs> cats. Lots and lots of videos of cats. You know, cats get me nervous. I don't know about the videos of cats. Bye guys. Well, you're weird, Jerry. That's dusty. Well, it's, it's like not as half the cat videos are, you know, you're being stalked by the cat and the cat, you know, you look around the corner and the cat freezes while it's about to attack you. How is that calming? <laughs> because what it pounces on you, it purrs. Oh, that's true. And then it does makes muffins on your, on your chest or something like that. I love that. Miss my cat. <laughs> <laughs> I want to argue for hope. Come on. I mean, we hear it's, again. Yeah, start, we're, you're we're, starting we're, late in the call, Bo, but go ahead. <laughs> We've, you know, it's always been the end of the world, and we're just in another cycle. I, I, I you know, I agree that fascism is peeking around the corner all over the world. Nationalism's all over the world. Oh, uh, come on, so, Jimmy, don't be so depressing. So I will argue that the thing I put in conversation, like two thirds of the way through the call, which is, are we at a generational tipping point <clears throat> where young people just get? Frickin' fed up with what's going on and say, nope, we're done. We're going to act together and fix these things. Could act, might actually be happening. And I would suggest that that is an optimistic scenario. And, and to me, that's the systemic change that I think is required. In other words, you've got to get something that overloads the existing, quote, system that just says, I've had enough. I don't care what you call this, but it's not that. In other words, they're just going to, what I consider to be the Bernie Sanders effect, that you've got to have enough momentum and enough people following him that you get a legislative change, not just a channel change. And in that sense, 45, 
the Cheetos Jesus, is a bit of a godsend exactly. because he's creating so much anxiety and hatred and backlash that this might actually cause these movements to begin to work in concert. The problem right. is that liberals tend to shoot each other instead of work in concert. That's, I think that's a really big issue. Um, but, I think that that's the difference of the millennials. The millennials, yeah. I think, are going to be more likely to coalesce and, and understand the value of coalescing than the other you know, older groups. Exactly. Have you all been following the, the – there's a meme that Trump is God's broken fail, sort of a, uh, broken messenger and that the Bible predicts Trump and that – like like – on the right, on, on the evangelical side, there are a whole bunch of people. There were, Michelle Bachman was quoted as saying this uh, just a couple of days ago, that, that, that hey, when, when, maybe when the Antichrist comes or whatever it is, when, when we get to these times, the messenger is going to be a flawed human, so that's okay. So everything Trump does is, in fact, a sign that he is this guy. That's an active meme. Oh. <laughs> They don't do that in the final times. <laughs> I don't see that stuff. Where do you see this stuff? Where it's out there. Plumbing. It's out there. Reddit. The truth, the truth is out there, Bo. Well, I don't want to see that truth. Yeah. <laughs> so I just posted a couple of things to the chat. One is a art piece from Bloomberg from a couple of months ago about cow vigilantes. Yep. Just, um, and the other is something I wrote about a year ago. Uh, it's a, a scenario, counterfactual scenario. What, what would it be like if Hillary had won? Mm. And you realize that none of the other institutional forces will have changed, and you'd still have an a overwhelmingly Republican uh, Congress at that at that point, um, and uh, all of the you know Fox News, and you'd, and you'd have Trump up there, you know, with his alternative channel pushing a whole bunch of crap, and none of the the investigations into Russia wouldn't be happening because oh, you would stop trying to relitigate the last election, you won, get over it. You know, that kind of stuff. And um, it was, you know, I'm sure it's exaggerated in some ways, but I, it was a thought experiment. What really would it have been like if Hillary had won? And I think that we wouldn't, we wouldn't have, an, have had an AOC. We wouldn't have the kind of, um, well, the kind of stuff that Jerry was talking about earlier in terms of this generational um, momentum. Uh, and I, I, I think that it would have been, it would just have felt in uh, arguably even more depressing because it would be just a sense of nothing ever works. We went mm -hmm. through eight years of Obama getting pushed back on everything. Now we're going to go through four or eight years of Clinton being pushed back, you know, getting pushed back on everything. And it's just, so I, th you know, I think that if we survive him, uh, Trump's, Trump will have been a, ultimately a positive thing for, for the world because of the backlash that he engendered. Good. But if we survive him. <laughs> let's, let's think about it. You know, I can express the, the crypto capitalist oligarch point of view. And, let me, and from that point of view, Hillary Clinton was really good for my portfolio. Come on, she was status quo. And it's, it, to me, it's a heartening thing that Bernie Sanders almost took her out. And so, because the Democratic Party is, has been, Bill Clinton's the best free trader ever. The Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, they're just Republicans in, you know, pink clothing. Right. <laughs> and uh, we really need something more than that. So, Jamey, I hope that jives in with what you're saying, because that's what I'm hoping for. And let's think of the millennials, they're... they're they don't have much invested in the status quo. They're not gaining. Right. No, and there a lot of them have, have, uh, are in massive debt because of, of uh, college, mm -hmm. uh, college loans. Um, I, 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 one thing I like about, about uh, Buddha Judge yeah. is <laughs> that um, Nicely done. he's younger than me. I don't mm -hmm. want a president older than me ever again. Which is a sad moment when we realize we're older than this, you know, older than presidents and all that. Uh, Todd and Dave, uh, last words. Go ahead, Todd. Yeah, I, I feel like I need to speak up for flyover country. Um, I, because of the media and because of the depiction of rallies, um, I, I think that you people on the coast 
<laughs> you people. kind of lose lose touch with the entire center of the country is not Trumpite. It's much closer to David Brooks. Reading David Brooks lately about community, about social fabric, um, the 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 Trumpite fa faction is loud. It's militant. It's visible. Um, but I would estimate, you know, in these environs, it's one out of four people. Um, it's it's not sixty percent. Oh. Uh, certainly not as high. And it's I, thirty-seven I think... percent nationally. Yeah, the people who the people who support Trump, no matter what, seems to to have a have a, a bottom. You know, a, a level of about thirty-seven percent nationally. Right, which is a huge number of humans. That so is a not, large number of humans, so but it's not a majority. And I and I think you're, it's worth uh, what uh, what Todd was saying is is very important to reiterate and to emphasize that there yeah. are plenty of of people in the Midwest who, you know, we may not think of as liberals, but certainly are not the kind of um, are, are not fascists in training. Yeah, but the thing and, is, there's been a lot of loss here. Um, and I, I think that that is much greater than economic loss. It's just a, a failure to have frameworks, worldviews, for how our perception of the world is changing, not just the world itself. And so all of the, the political hot button issues are not as important as the social fabric changing. Um, and people here in the Great Lakes region um, falsely long for the days when it seemed like community was widespread and easy. Um, and I think that there's some delusions there, um, but it, it, this, is, this is not a bunch of people with guns in the streets, though you see that every once in a while. Um, it's people who feel like they've lost a lot. Like what have so, they lost? What have they lost? Well, let me just interject a, a, a quick thing because I just put a link in the chat. Todd, I'm, I'm hearing you and I, I want more people to be on Brooks's range than on the firing range on the far right. Um, but the, the thing that scared me was the precinct level map of the 2016 election where I looked at Oregon and in my mind I thought, well, the right half of the state is pretty red. The left half might be blue. No, 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 no. There are two counties where Portland exists. Um, and once you set foot outside those counties, the vote was 74% for Trump. Now that might be some middle of the roaders registering a protest vote saying, well, I guess if it's between Trump and Hillary, I'm gonna go for Trump and whatever. But the middle of the country, out, the whole center of the country at a precinct level, the, the, the blue was just a little veneer on the outsides and a couple of little dots, you know, Austin, Ann Arbor, uh, Boulder, what have you, and you got outside the metropolitan areas and it was Trump, 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 Trump at a very deep level, right? So that truly frightened me. Yeah, except that don't be, don't um, mistake area for density. I get yeah. it, but, but. Yeah, a big, a, a big part of those, you know, red, quote unquote, red counties are empty. You know, and so yeah, you're absolutely right. The the county or the or the precinct may have gone red, but that's because it's a you know it also is a very small number of people compared to the massive numbers of people in the cities. And that's you know that's actually one of the political difficulties that we're dealing with globally is right. the uh, political structures that were were set up under a different balance of urban rural populations, yeah, and. You know, now we have systems that give undue weight to the votes of, uh, of voices in um, rural areas. I mean, there are more people who play World of Warcraft than who are employed in farms um, in, the, in the United States. That makes sense. There are now, as of the most recent polling, there are now more atheists than evangelicals. What? In the United States. A atheists. Not, uh, no religions which okay. is sort of encompasses atheists and agnostic, but you know, no religion, uh, more, more of those than, than evangelicals or Catholics. Yeah. Sorry, Todd, I interrupted you. Were you gonna... oh, yeah, what? just one more, one more thing I'll throw in there. Uh, there are people who migrate towards Trump because of what he symbolizes to them. Um, but I think the 
the overriding feeling is just anti-elitism, anti-establishment. I'm mm -hmm. sick of people telling me what to do and who I am and what to think. That's where the mo majority of the passion is coming from. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else with uh, closing thoughts for this call? Bo is looking suspiciously at that idea. Oh, I, want I, I put in two links. Sorry, Jay. So I'll flag them real Thanks, fast before, before Bo closes things down. One was a, a, a link about your, um, uh, the era, this is the era of youth, and Peter Levine has written some stuff about the increase in voting in 2018 and 2016 for youth. And then the other one was just a link uh, arguing with the um, idea that all job growth is on the coasts, that new, newest job growth may be more in the Trump region. So, uh, two, two links. Interesting. There. Yeah, yeah. Where's that? I want to see that link. Where's that? Is that the Edsall article? Yeah, it's the Edsall article. In the, yeah. yeah, Thomas Edsall, who's a really, really terrific New York Times columnist. He's pretty thoughtful, yeah. He's a very deep thinker. His articles are always a long read with a lot of links. And for an old guy to put a lot of links in, in articles consistently is a really great and great thing. Um, but I, I like what he says very often. So <clears throat> it's Edsall's column. Scroll up in the chat. I will uh, copy the chat and send it to all of us when I have uploaded the call. Any, any other closing thoughts? I, I need to run. I'm going to go to another call. Yeah, thank Talk you. To Talk to you. All right. Thanks for being here. Ciao, babies. Yeah. For now, until next month, and see you on the list, uh, we'll talk rainbows and puppies next time. And kitties. And, oh, got to remember the kitties. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.